Hidden Valleys by Matt Strassler. You can probably recognize this famous plot. Uh, it's a useful illustration of the kinds of phenomenology that's going on. Standard model particles collide through some heavy mediator. Uh, in this talk, this will mostly be the standard model Higgs boson, has some decays to hidden sector states that undergo substantial evolution in their own sector before the states that are stable within the hidden sector ultimately you know, decay through their much weaker interactions back to standard model final states, or in some cases, not at all. There's a really interesting class of theories for a wide range of reasons. As I believe you've heard from other speakers in this series, uh, they can be used to solve a variety of problems of the standard model. For instance, uh, the hierarchy problem uh, through mechanisms like neutral naturalness, where the partners of the uh, standard model, such as the top quark, uh, that are responsible for uh, canceling the contributions to the quadratic divergence in the Higgs mass are charged under a hidden uh, mirror copy of the uh, QCD gauge interactions. Uh, other motivations include baryogenesis. Of course, any uh, hidden sector that's not charged under standard model interactions is a prime opportunity to get a dark matter candidate out. More broadly, though, the possibility that dark uh, new physics, physics beyond the standard model, could have you know, non-perturbative interactions is a generic possibility. If you look at the standard model and ask what ingredients does nature like to use, one of the things that naturally comes to mind is non-adelian gauge interactions. And if you take that seriously, you should think that, well, if we're trying to be as generic and as flexible as possible in our search for what nature might have uh, in mind, looking for confining hidden sectors is an important uh, part of making sure that we are really covering all the possibilities. Uh, there we go. Uh, there, of course, besides these theoretical motivations, some, I think, rather compelling at this point, experimental motivations to look for uh, confining hidden valleys. One of these reasons is that the signatures that these theories predict are generically qualitatively distinct compared to the perturbative uh, signature, the signatures from perturbative beyond the standard models. The signature uh, I'm going to refer to as a dark shower. So dark shower is a signature. Uh, confining theories are, you know, the model. Uh, so just as in QCD, for instance, if you start out producing one, you know, quark, say now one dark quark, it undergoes a complicated uh, process of evolution, both uh, in the parton shower stage, which is perturbative, and in the hadronization stage, non-perturbative. And ultimately, you get a uh, possibly large multiplicity of uh, dark color neutral states out at the end. So you, instead of you know, looking for you know, one isolated final state object, instead you have this uh, multiplicity of states out at, the, out at the end. This is important because as you know, uh, the LHC has done a you know, amazing job of searching rather comprehensively for uh, new physics in sort of standard <laughs> final states and so far has not found anything. These more challenging final states are one of the places where substantial sort of qualitative progress can be made uh, with you know, you know, real hope to significantly expand the scope of the searches that we're looking for, uh, whereas a lot of the searches that look for you know, perturbative new physics are now kinematically limited and won't substantially advance. Um, so this is part of why I think this kind of uh, model is really important to think about how we can both um, support the you know, rather challenging experimental searches, uh, as well as make sure we understand theoretically some of the ingredients that are really necessary to do a good job of doing that. So dark showers, the signature that, that we're going to focus on, have a lot of characteristic features. So they have a variable object multiplicity per event. You don't always get the same number of hadrons out. Uh, this object multiplicity can potentially be large, but not always. The distribution of both energy, you know, particles, uh, and the number of you know, various standard model flavors you know, produced in the final state uh, is very much non-standard model-like. So you get distributions of you know, energy flow within jets, you know, you know, standard model particle multiplicities that reflects the fact that some evolution went through non-standard model states. Uh, the final state objects are very often not isolated, um, which complicates reconstruction. And one point that's going to be quite important, we'll come back to this later, is that one generically has, given this you know, set of dark hadrons that are produced, they generically have a hierarchy of proper lifetimes. 
So these searches are hard. There's a reason that uh, they weren't explored first. Experimentally, they involve uh, frequently, especially when long-lived particles are involved, novel reconstruction algorithms, not out-of-the-box objects. And the calibration of background contributions to the kinds of observables that are necessary to do you know, interesting searches are often also challenging, either because they require uh, evaluation of you know, challenging physics backgrounds, such as you know, QCD backgrounds, you know, uh, backgrounds in unusual kinematic regimes, or sometimes non-physics backgrounds, which are even more hard to really you know, pin down. Theoretically, these searches are also very hard. And the reason for that is manifold. So this is an enormous and very poorly understood space of theories to start with. And you know, to state the obvious, it is much harder to make concrete predictions for you know, non-perturbative theories than it is for perturbative theories. These calculations are hard. In some cases, we have some concrete data that can help us you know, inform making you at least partly reliable predictions. Some models, we know what the low-lying hadron spectra are from uh, lattice studies. In some cases, there are Monte Carlo tools for hadronization. These are all, of course, developed for and tuned to QCD because this is a non-perturbative process where you know, lattice will let us calculate static things like spectra, some branching ratios, some uh, you know, form factors which let us calculate branching ratios, but it can't let us uh, compute the dynamic processes uh, that are uh, important for hadronization. So their you know, data and therefore QCD is really our only source of uh, you know, rigorous input. So figuring out how to say you know, realistic predictions is therefore enormously hard, requires a lot of thought. Um, and figuring out how to guide a broad search strategy with uh, feasible amounts of theoretical work is uh, not always an easy or obvious problem. So one powerful aspect of dark shower searches experimentally is long-lived particles. So confining hidden sectors very generically lead to the existence of long-lived particles. We can see that in uh, the standard model, for instance, where you can see on this plot taken from this uh, nice review article, um, particles uh, in the standard model um, arranged to show their uh, lifetime versus their mass. There are two reasons why, two primary reasons why uh, confining hidden sectors are more likely to lead to long-lived particles. One of them is that the stable particles, the hadrons, are composite states and they, they decay through high mass dimension operators. So they end up with a large scale separation between their mass and uh, the mass of whatever operators you know, enabling them to decay raised to a reasonably large power. Um, you can see here, these different lines are arranged by you know, different powers and a lot of our you know, favorite mesons are living up here. Uh, another reason is that uh, accidental global symmetries uh, often help you know, enhance the lifetime, you know, you know, accidentally suppress uh, the decay rate of mesons uh, or other kinds of hadrons. These could be discrete, such as uh, CP, or they could be approximate flavor symmetries. Um, again, these are familiar examples. Uh, CP conservation, for instance, makes the uh, K long, you know, anomalously long-lived uh, because it only has a CP uh, violating decay mode open to it. Um, you know, kinematically. Uh, pions, you know, the difference between the neutral pion, which is dramatically shorter lived than the charged pions, is the fact that uh, charged pions uh, uh, carry isospin and the isospin neutral pion can decay through the chiral anomaly. Um, other examples, uh, of course, you know, approximate conservation of B number, keep, uh, you know, heavy flavor uh, symmetry helps keep the B long lived compared to uh, other compared to the sort of scaling from its lifetime. Okay. So generically, given a, you know, some confining hidden sector, you expect some combination of prompt, displaced, and detector stable objects. And the number of long lived objects that you expect increases as the mass scale goes down. And this is uh, you know, key important feature to keep in mind. 
So long lived particles are a really powerful tool for suppressing standard model backgrounds. I'm showing here two plots uh, that you know demonstrate this. This first plot is somewhat old, but, but it's very clean in making this point. Uh, this is looking for, this is a search that's looking for uh, We cannot hear you. Oh, at least I cannot hear you. Closest approach to the beam pipe in the transverse direction. And you can see here that there are a variety of standard model backgrounds broken down here. Uh, and that and they fall off very steeply as you go out to larger and larger impact parameter until at the largest impact parameters here, you're essentially background free. This is a more recent plot. This is a now showing uh, Dimuon pairs, looking at a dimuon invariant mass. Here, the muons are coming from the same vertex, and the displacement is measured by the transverse distance of that vertex to the beam pipe. And you can see the same trend. Uh, the lowest two bins, um, this is somewhat less obvious because the boost dependence is very important here. Uh, but as you go out to larger and larger uh, displacement of the muon vertex from the beam pipe, the background drops off you know, by orders and orders of magnitude. So because of this large suppression, displaced searches often use just the existence of displaced objects as their primary discriminator between signal and background, which means that searches are often then relatively insensitive to what else is going on in the event. This search, for instance, its primary cuts were basically just well-reconstructed uh, displaced you know, electron muon pair after that, it was essentially background free and they reported limits on one signal model, uh, but because they required very little else uh, uh, in the event, uh, my postdoc Jared, at the time, Jared Evans and I went on to show that that was a leading set of constraints for a wide range of other models. And this search is actually a scouting search. So the only data that they record is actually the uh, dimuon pair. And we're gonna show today that these searches are actually the leading limit or on a class of interesting low mass dark shower models, uh, as we'll discuss. So long lived particles, therefore, have the potential to offer powerful, relatively inclusive searches. This is especially important if you're looking for low mass dark sectors where you know, the overall kinematics of the event is not useful for background re rejection. You know, back <laughs> backgrounds fall off very steeply in you know, anything with, you know, powers of dimensions of mass, so center of mass energy, object PT, and so on. If you're looking for relatively low mass signals, you're sitting sort of intrinsically in a region of high standard model background. And so having long-lived particles, which again becomes more likely if you're living at low mass, uh, can be extremely powerful. But this has a you know, important theoretical drawback. It means that your interesting detector signal, the one that gives you any hope of digging these signatures out of the enormous standard model backgrounds, is inextricably tied to the multiplicity of a specific dark hadron species, the one that's giving you, you know, whatever decay is, is interesting. And that is a problem because that is inherently incalculable. Uh, even in QCD, you know, <laughs> uh, where we have lots of information, you know, fragmentation functions are measured at one energy and extrapolated to another. In a, you know, non-standard model theory, we have no idea how to calculate this in any rigorous way. That's a problem. Another issue that is important for people to keep in mind is that when we talk about dark showers, we often use language um, like dark shower, the, you know, the perturbative parton shower. That doesn't happen in every uh, confining theory. The existence of jets is something that we sort of inherit from QCD. All of our you know, intuition about dealing with uh, confining hidden uh, sectors is derived either from QCD or depending on the audience, sometimes from uh, ADS CFT. Depending on the value of the uh, Tuft coupling, G squared NC, uh, QCD lives at small uh, atoft coupling, a very large atoft coupling. You expect spherical events, which is pointed out uh, in some very nice work uh, here. Um, that is at least a quantitative prediction that one can use. But at moderate atoft coupling, G squared NC of order one, nobody really knows. We don't have good theoretical tools. 
uh, some toy models, uh, and I emphasize these are toy models from uh, uh, these people give event shapes that are sort of a, a combination of jetty and spherical, very diverse. And I emphasize this is a toy model. We don't, and we, <laughs> it's hard to make, again, precise, well-informed predictions away from the QCD-like regime. This is also, you know, uncomfortable. And it's something that we need to keep in mind when we think about making sure that we're uh, covering the range of possibilities well. The particular approach that I advocate, um, and this is an approach developed uh, in collaboration with uh, Simon Ngoppen, is in reaction to these you know, big uncertainties, develop searches for uh, that focus on displaced objects at low PT, because that is where the experimental discovery opportunities are potentially maximized. Um, and focusing on low PT, which is experimentally hard, it pushes the experimental capability, which therefore maximizes the discovery sensitivity um, for less well understood models, even if the searches themselves are done in terms of models that, where we can make more precise prescriptions. Making sure that we cover and pick up as many possible BSM signatures as possible is a key, development, key element in developing a very broad discovery coverage. In order to help guide this program, uh, we will develop QCD-like benchmarks uh, and prioritize inclusivity at the analysis level to make sure that uh, you know, the search is done, therefore maintain sensitivity to as much uh, of the you know, enormous parameter space of confining hidden sectors as possible. So I'll talk here about two different directions. Uh, one of them uh, uses simplified models. These are not you know, nicely defined UV complete uh, confining sectors. The motivation for doing this work was to establish guidelines to identify the most promising final states where you know, work done to expand experimental covers would you know, really be well motivated from the point of view of uh, looking for final states that are you know, easy to realize in realistic models. And then I will uh, go, then go on to talk about a more specific model. This is a you know, UV complete insofar as hadronization uncertainties allow model. Uh, it's a two flavor, uh, uh, three color you know, cousin of QCD. Uh, part of the motivation for uh, developing this model uh, was to have a flexible but simple signature generator that can realize a range of low mass signatures to help uh, push the search for low mass displaced uh, signals farther. So that's the plan. So this is the typical anatomy of a dark shower event, you know, shown here in highly cartooned version. The important thing to note here is that uh, this proceeds in a variety of stages. Uh, first, you produce you know, standard model, initial states collide, uh, make a mediator, uh, then uh, produces some, we'll consider, you know, dark quarks. They undergo shower and hadronization. And then eventually some of the uh, produced dark sector hadrons decay back into the standard model. So I'm gonna say some words about each one of these steps. The, you know, one key feature to keep in mind, production and decay are a lot easier to get a handle on than the shower and hadronization because these are the steps that involve the standard model and that's where we can actually say something really concrete. So to start with production, in this talk, I am primarily going to focus on uh, particle production in exotic decays of the standard model Higgs boson. This is minimal in the sense that I don't have to add an additional heavy mediator to the theory. Uh, it's well motivated in the sense that the uh, standard model Higgs is one of the most sensitive places in the standard model. Uh, if you are looking for uh, operators that can sort of easily connect to total standard model singlet physics. Standard model Higgs is also a low mass mediator. 125 GeV is not particularly heavy uh, by the standards of LHC events, which means that again, we're living in this very challenging kinematic environment where the kinematics of the signal events alone are not useful to separate signal from background. So that means uh, this is a challenging benchmark for trigger and analysis development on the experimental side. And again, part of the reason why we are emphasizing this uh, is because 
developing experimental sensitivity to soft long-lived particles, uh, if that experimental uh, sensitivity is as robust as possible, that will really help us mitigate the uncertainties about you know, multiplicities, event shape uh, on the theoretical side. Um, so the production through the standard model Higgs boson uh, can also be nice because if you <laughs> get desperate about uh, developing uh, triggers that can grab onto very soft displaced things, it's a hard problem. There's a built-in fallback mechanism through uh, the associated production modes of the Higgs with other standard model objects. So uh, in some cases with very challenging final states, that might be the best way to actually get the events on tape. Um, I will skip this unless someone asks about it. Um, for the evolution, uh, for all the models, all the work I'll be talking about, we use the Pythia 8 Hidden Valley module. So this was developed by uh, Torbjorn Sostrand and collaborators. Um, it uh, describes a SUNC, a number of colors NC uh, gauge theory with a variable number of flavors. Of course, uh, it is most reliable for uh, the standard model light case where the number of colors is three, and that's what I will use here. Uh, this is you know, based on QCD. So as a QCD-like parton shower evolution, it makes some approximations uh, that uh, one should be aware of and can limit its uh, usefulness, especially at large NF. Um, and it has a QCD informed hadronization model. It's worth bearing in mind that the hadronization model is somewhat uh, knows about a somewhat stripped down hadron sector. So it only knows about spin one and spin zero mesons. Um, one really important update happened about a year ago, uh, work by uh, Torbjorn, uh, Matt Strassler and uh, collaborators, where the dark flavor symmetries uh, newly became breakable in the sense that one could assign uh, out of the, you know, NF squared minus one, you know, uh, flavor, you know, adjoint representations of these spin zero mesons, you could individually set those uh, dark pion masses and as well uh, on the spin one. So in other words, you can actually now uh, use the Pythia 8 Hidden Valley mod module in a much more flexible way. And this will be very important for the uh, dark flavor breaking specific model that I'll talk about later. But even there is worth remembering, this is a relatively stripped down uh, hadron sector and the modeling of the parton, uh, of how a parton multiplicity translates into a hadron multiplicity relies on a lot of modeling assumptions. There are some knobs that you can dial when you use this to control the multiplicity of various uh, specific dark hadrons and therefore the multiplicity of how many like actual standard model states you see uh, in your detector. Uh, and so it's worth bearing in mind, this is always going to be a somewhat simplified model of the evolution in a hidden sector, no matter what. Um, that means if you want to consider doing experimental searches that rely on this module, and I want to mention this is a lot of work uh, to create and maintain this tool. And it is by far the best tool on the market. There's really no other uh, general uh, replacement for this tool. Its predictions must be considered part of the model definition. And that's just something, something that is true and unfortunate if you want to do searches for uh, non-perturbative hidden sectors. So decay, again, this is where we start to make contact with the standard model. It's easier to say concrete things. The choice of decay portal, how the dark mesons couple back to the standard model, is what's most responsible for setting what the actual detector signatures are. Uh, it doesn't control the overall you know, energy, but it controls what final states appear, and it has a huge impact on the possible lifetimes that the mesons can have. So in this paper, Simon uh, Choudong and I wrote down a variety of decay portals uh, and studied the consequences uh, to show you, to, to guide you, these uh, orange ones are scalar mesons. Uh, the blue indicates a vector meson. Uh, we wrote down a limited set of operators. The philosophy we used was we considered operator dimensions up to five. So 
two renormalizable uh, portals and uh, two uh, dimension five portals. Uh, we didn't consider the neutrino portal, which is also dimension four, because we didn't want to deal with beyond the standard model flavor violation. Uh, then we wrote down one additional model where we introduced uh, here in uh, sort of red tan, uh, a fundamental dark photon, and then let a scalar dark meson decay to pairs of dark photons very analogous to uh, standard model pion decay. So this set of operators gives you a wide range of phenomenological signatures. Ones that go through to gluons or Higgs bosons give you hadron-rich uh, final states. Uh, if you get decay directly to photons through this kind of coupling, you have a, a photon shower. And then ones that involve the uh, vector portal uh, tend to give you uh, leptons at an interesting rate. And those are some of the most interesting ones for low mass dark sectors, because the choice of part of portal has a huge impact on the lifetime that you generically expect for your light dark mesons. So the it is actually hard when you start looking at sort of things below sort of 10 GeV or so to get your light mesons to decay inside your detector. This is for a combination of reasons. Sometimes there are direct bounds on portal couplings that are important. Uh, generally, it is a combination of the fact that the mesons are composite states. And so you know, there's a large separation of scales as they get lighter that is raised to a high power. Uh, combined with model building for heavy states in whatever UV completion introduces these effective operators. Um, so you have a high power and you have constraints on the denominator and you know things get big. So here's one example. This is uh, the scalar meson decaying to pairs of gluons in the gluon portal. It has some decay constant uh, in the uh, low energy effective theory. If we UV complete this, then the scalar meson, well, it's, this is uh, made by this dimension three operator. Uh, one minimal UV completion that you can write down involves a, a fundamental pseudoscalar. Here has some Yukawa couplings. We need some new colored state to generate this loop. Uh, that state there is going to be constrained by LHC constraints on uh, new colored particles to be of order TeV or so. So concretely, the decay constant is suppressed by a uh, couple powers of this scale. Um, we need this guy to be reasonably heavy. Um, and if you crank up the Yukawa couplings as large as you're you know, safely able to do perturbatively, and then calculate what the resulting lifetime is, you end up with something that is of order, you know, seven centimeters uh, and very steeply dependent on the eta mass. So another example, um, if you have this vector meson talking to uh, uh, final states through a vector portal, um, this UV completion uh, requires a fundamental you know, kinetically mixed dark photon that talks to both the uh, the dark quarks and then you know, mixes with a st with the standard model photon to give you uh, uh, leptons or hadrons over here. So the effective kinetic mixing that uh, enters between the uh, omega meson and the uh, standard model photon is then down compared to the fundamental portal coupling by this ratio of scales, this constraint on the portal coupling translates into uh, this lower bound. Um, again, mass dependent. This is mass dependent also, but not as steeply as the vector portal. Th this kind of analysis we did for all of the uh, portals that we considered, and it gave us the following theoretical estimates. And I stress, these are estimates for minimum reasonably achievable dark hadron lifetime. So this is what you're willing to do. This is a kind of typical minimum lifetime that you get if you aren't trying to you know, bend over backward to you know, get the minimum lifetime possible. Um, so again, these are not hard lower bounds, but they're guides to understand where high multiplicity signals at, in particular low mass are the most interesting. So if you're interested in detector scale decays, let's say, you know, cut this off at a generous hundred meters. Um, so if you, <laughs> you 
you know, you aren't going to be seeing multiple displaced vertices um, for, you know, gluon portal or Higgs portal theories if you are, you know, looking at things of order, you know, few GeV. Um, if you want to look at very light mesons, the easiest way to get multiple visible displaced decays are through you know, the dark photon portal, of course, as you have an elementary dark photon, also photon portal, uh, vector portal. So again, part of the point of this exercise is, is it worth developing you know, very hard searches and grab onto low mass you know, pairs of displaced hadronic vertices? I look at this uh, plot and I say, it's not, worth pushing that down below 10 GeV substantially because it's a lot of work and it's hard to get a theory that will appreciably populate that. Um, more interesting is if you want to really push sensitivity uh, at low masses, you sort of to multi-displaced object final states, then the ones that are most interesting to look at are cases where you involve um, electroweak uh, objects more strongly. This is true from the theoretical point of view as well as the experimental point of view because low PT dimuons um, are therefore motivated both uh, from, the th from, from this lifetime argument, but also experimentally, muons in particular are well reconstructable even at the trigger level and even at relatively low PT. And what that means is uh, it is easy to get easy to get um, good coverage of low PT dimuons even when they're displaced uh, because the you know, reconstruction of these you know, even low PT, even displaced muons can be done uh, very rapidly uh, at the trigger uh, and therefore with this partial event reconstruct, uh, construction, they can you know, read out uh, a limited subset of information from the whole event, um, which enables them to keep a large number of, uh, very large number of uh, displaced low mass muon pairs at the cost of you know, throwing away all the information that isn't muons from the rest of the event. This analysis strategy is broadly similar to what LHCB has been doing uh, more broadly for some time, as a strategy known as the turbo stream, where they have fully online reconstruction and they read out a reduced event format that allows them to basically you know, record more events because they're reading out less information per event. So we developed uh, partly to help you know, support this, uh, you know, what can you do with uh, scouting information? Uh, Simon and I and these students, uh, Susan Bourne and Rohit Karur, uh, developed a Hidden Valley module uh, model that produces a range of dimuon signatures. We designed this with particular interest in uh, having this at relatively low PT and having uh, the dimuons you know, potentially be displaced, uh, but it doesn't intrinsically require that. This is a three color, two flavor model we also include, besides the uh, non-abelian gauge group, uh, you know, gauge bosons and you know, matter fields, an elementary dark photon that has chiral couplings to the dark quarks. Uh, it, along with this dark photon, we include an abelian dark Higgs boson. And the reason we want chiral couplings of the dark photons to the dark quarks is so that when we write down the Yukawa interactions that will ultimately give these dark quarks their mass, it is now misaligned with the gauge basis for the uh, 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 confining gauge group. So you can think about this as a stripped down realization of uh, SU2 left uh, in the standard model. Uh, SU2 left, of course, has chiral couplings to the uh, you know, standard model quarks. And partly because of that, you enable, well, entirely because of that, you enable um, uh, meson decays, uh, where one meson species can decay to another by emitting a, you know, in the standard model, off-shell W boson. 
So we'll see similar phenomenology here with the dark photon uh, being able to, you know, being able to appear in transitions from one meson to another. So you can see from this uh, particle content here, we have uh, a you know, anomaly free set of uh, uh, charge assignments. We have two uh, dark color fundamentals with equal and opposite dark charges, two anti fundamentals of the uh, color group that are uh, charge neutral, and the Higgs boson, the elementary dark Higgs, allows the dark quarks to get mass in uh, in pairs um, once the electro once the dark, uh, gauge symmetry is broken. So, in terms of the meson degrees of freedom, we focus on the four spin zero mesons. We have a pion triplet, and we have a uh, flavor uh, flavor singlet, the dark eta meson. Uh, the elementary dark photon is massive. And the uh, dark Higgs uh, can have some Higgs portal coupling that uh, naturally gives you exotic Higgs decays into this sector. Okay, so this is what the theory looks like. I'll go through this. So we imagine we have the Higgs and it produces these guys uh, through its uh, mixing with the dark Higgs. Um, the eta meson uh, is not a gold stone. Uh, it has its uh, mass you know, from, from instanton contributions, which is of order the confinement scale. The mass squared of the pions is of course much lighter with uh, in terms of the average uh, dark quark mass. But because we have the uh, chiral couplings with the dark photon, so we want the dark photon to be light. Um, the dark photon gets two sources of mass. It gets mass from the VEV of the fundamental Higgs, but it also gets mass from the uh, chiral symmetry breaking of the uh, uh, dark QCD and the pions here. This is, again, you know, think about uh, standard QCD. The, uh, the chiral condensate contributes you know, a very small amount to the SE2 left gauge boson masses. Uh, now we are in a limit where the dark photon is you know, light compared to the uh, pions, which means we have to be careful about how the uh, dark photon, um, the goldstone boson that is eaten by the uh, dark photon to furnish the longitudinal mode is now a linear combination of the you know, fundamental goldstone from the Higgs multiplet and the pions here. So this mass mixing between the you know, composite goldstones and the fundamental goldstones uh, means that one of our dark goldstones, uh, our model, we have a, a sort of simple charge assignment where we align the you know, direction of breaking in sort of the, the isospin space with uh, pi one. So pi one is the goldstone that mixes with the fundamental goldstone and that splits the pi on multiplet a little bit. The degree of mixing is controlled by uh, how much of the symmetry breaking comes from the composite sector versus the uh, fundamental sector. Uh, then the isospin breaking also enables uh, the uh, singlet to mix with the one of the triplet states, the triplet that is aligned with the direction of isospin mixing in uh, pion space. And so that uh, further splits the pion multiplet by an amount, by a mixing angle that depends on the uh, degree of you know, isospin violation in the dark quark mass matrix. So this spectrum then gives us, you know, fully split pi on multiplet. Uh, you can see by the way this is written that we're taking this isospin splitting to be small. This is for a variety of reasons. One reason is we make this choice for compatibility with Pythia. Pythia assumes you know, Pythia will let you set the masses of all the part, uh, you know, particles in the dark octet separately, but the uh, Lund string model is expecting, you know, pi plus and pi minus to be each other's, you know, uh, antiparticle. That's not the case here. Uh, so we wanted to minimize the degree to which we violated Pythia, you know, the Lund string model's uh, assumptions, and so we uh, worked with a, we we stuck with this limit where the uh, where, where the isospin splitting is small, and that's controlled in large part by uh, how much the uh, 
condensate versus the fundamental Higgs gives mass of A. Uh, requiring that the gauge boson is still light compared to the pions is then a condition on what the uh, dark quark Yukawa couplings are, uh, but we have enough freedom to comfortably set that without requiring extreme uh, Yukawa choices. Okay, so given this setup, we have a wide range of possibilities for the decay chains in this model, depending on uh, what the eta mass is compared to the pion mass and the dark photon mass. So the chiral anomaly, uh, if we didn't have the isospin breaking, that would be pi three that could decay through the chiral anomaly. With the chiral, with the isospin breaking, the eta also inherits that decay mode. Uh, but the dark flavor breaking also enables and this was you know, the whole point, this uh, off diagonal decay of eta to uh, pi two a, uh, and then the dark photon. So if the eta is heavy enough compared to the pions that it can decay kinematically to uh, three pi, uh, that's me mediated by the dark sector strong interactions. We assume that happens as, uh, as long as it's kinematically open. Uh, but then if the dark pions are heavy enough that that is closed, uh, you have a range of other possibilities. Um, if the dark pion is uh, kinematically able to decay to pairs of dark photons, then it, then that lives over here uh, in this, basically above the, uh, below this flat line, uh, this decay is open. Below this diagonal line, uh, the eta can decay to a prime pi two uh, kinematically. So in this region, that's the only option. In this region, there's a competition uh, between these two decay modes. But then in the salmon region here, uh, kinematically, the only decay mode available to the eta is through an off-shell dark photon producing this three-body decay. So what this does, ah, sorry, <laughs> one last thing um, before I get into uh, the, the uh, signatures. Because the mesomultiplicity is a really key feature in what the actual you know, signatures look like. It, uh, how many particles do you make per event? This is again strongly dependent on the sort of overall mass scale of the hidden valley part, uh, particle. We're showing here two different cases: one where the three pi decay is open, and one where it's closed. So, in this case. Um, one obvious thing to notice is that the eta multiplicity is much smaller than the pi multiplicity, and that's just basically because it's heavy. Uh, it's less likely to be produced in hadronization, uh, mostly because of its mass. Um, the you know, the uh, isospin symmetry in the you know, relative numbers of these particles, again, the mass splitting is small compared to the overall mass scale, and so you have an approximately isospin uh, symmetric production here. Over here, because the eta now uh, uh, has to decay to uh, pi twos, uh, the pi two multiplicity is larger uh, compared to pi one and pi three. So the one point that, again, I want to emphasize, to get these particular plots, we had to make some choices uh, in running the Pythia hadronization model. We had to make some choices for how often you're going to make vector mesons in the showering, that it, uh, vector mesons are carried to pairs of scalar mesons. So that affects you know, the overall multiplicity of the scalar mesons. We had to make some choices about how likely we thought the shower was to make the eta. Again, these choices have to be viewed as part of the definition of the model. And we have to make our best guess here and it's the, the best guess that we can do. Okay. So these are the signatures that we get, and these range from easy to hard, depending on how we play with the uh, mass and lifetime uh, parameters that we now have in the model. So we did all the setup, and I get to turn the knobs and see what we get out. So the so, was there a question? Yeah. yeah I have a question. Um, so first of all, I'm wondering if possible any of the dark pions can be a diameter changes. Can any of the dark pions decay instantaneously? Is that the question? I want to make sure I heard right. Because if any of the dark pion can be the dark matter candidate, is it possible? It can be a dark matter candidate? Yeah, yes. Oh, yeah, it, possibly. But I have to say that we did not uh, work out the dark matter uh, phenomenology. 
Um, so I can't tell you offhand uh, what the uh, cosmic relic, relic abundance is, but yeah, with the ingredients so far, uh, you know, pi pi one, for instance, is uh, is yeah. you know, stable. Yeah. And yeah. On the so other we hand, the energy in these events. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. So if it's possible, we can uh, use the uh, hidden value module in PSA to generate uh, something that baryon, like a dark uh, proton or dark neutron. One can. Um, I think in terms of whether or not you should uh, trust its predictions, that's another story. Um, you should not do this with um, NC equals two. I would stick to NC equals three. Oh, um, okay. But I think um, there's already a lot that we don't really understand about how good the, uh, these recommendations are. Um, and it, my so it depends on what you're trying to do, I think. If you want predictions that are, you know, careful, then you should mm -hmm. probably avoid baryons uh, now. But if you do, if you want to have something you don't care about it being as right as possible, and it gives you, you know, a signature that you couldn't get in other ways, then yeah, go for it. Uh, that's that's my philosophy. You know, use it wisely. <laughs> I see. Thanks a lot. Um, so yeah, so we have a range of daimyon signatures. Uh, one of the easiest ones in terms of being uh, sort of most easy experimental target to spot uh, is we call scenario A. This is where the uh, gauge coupling is big enough uh, that the decay of the uh, pi three meson to two dark photons uh, happens effectively promptly, and the dark photons themselves uh, are long lived. Um, then, if you play with the lifetimes, you can set it up so that actually it's uh, pi three that is long lived, uh, and the dark photons decay you know reasonably promptly. Um, or you could realize a similar kind of signature by uh, supposing that the eta is the long-lived particle and it decays to a dark photon, and that's how you get your you know, displaced dark photon. Uh, or then, of course, you can play with the mass hierarchy again and get this uh, you know, three-body decay. So what this lets us do is realize you know, four different scenarios. These two scenarios, they have you know, relatively high visible multiplicity because the particle that is giving you ultimately the visible standard model final states is the uh, pion. These two are low visible multi low visible multiplicity because the particle that's giving you, you know, ultimately your visible final states is the eta, which is produced much less often. Now, this one, scenario A, is easier because the long-lived particles uh, that produce the uh, dark photons were produced right at the you know, primary vertex, uh, the, the interaction point. And so if you look at the you know, reconstructed dark photon momentum from the final state pairs, it points back to the point of origin. Um, in this case over here, these are not pointing if, if I, because this A was not emitted from over here. And if I put together this you know, reconstructed momentum, I'll get something that doesn't point back to the, you know, the primary vertex. These are also you know, non-pointing. Pointing is, as we'll see, a powerful background suppression cut that is often used. Um, and having non-pointing example signal models is uh, one of the reasons that we set, that we went through this exercise. And then, of course, these are all resonant you know, fermion pairs. And this one is not resonant because it's a three-body decay. So you go from something where you make a reasonable number of you know, resonant pointing these are in general fermions, but experimentally we'll be interested in muons, uh, down through you know, large number of non-pointing resonant pairs, smaller number of non-pointing resonant pairs, and this is very hard. Okay, so let's talk about this. So scenario A, this is again the best case scenario. Uh, here you can see in this plot, uh, this is a plot of uh, the softer of you know, two muons in an event, uh, in an example, uh, scenario A benchmark, here's the specific parameters. And I'm showing you this plot because I want to emphasize this is a very low PT signal. Um, if you had a standard you know, prompt 
you know, CMS trigger cut, and that would be something around 10 GeV here, and you've already lost most of your signal. But it's even worse if you look for standard displaced uh, you know, dimuon triggers, at least uh, for the ones that have been in place so far, though there are proposals for new ones. But the scouting trigger goes all the way down here. So you can see this just keeps you know, an enormously large, larger fraction of the overall signal events. Uh, LHCB, by contrast, uh, it sees a smaller overall luminosity, which is why uh, you, you have this uh, overall, and it, it looks at a much more forward slice of, uh, of, of the detector, um, which is why the overall number uh, is, is lower here, but you can see that its uh, threshold is even lower. So these are you know, searches that are you know, public, reasonably well interpretable, and we'll show that these provide uh, good limits on these searches here. Um, so I will go a little quickly through this because I have an eye on the time. So these colored blobs are the recast. These are a variety of different choices of masses and mass hierarchies. Um, this is very important uh, because, especially for the CMS search, where the dark photon mass is really determines uh, what the background is and therefore what the sensitivity is. These dashed lines are where we estimated the reach of a uh, search that looked for two uh, displaced vertices as opposed to a single displaced muon pair. Um, we had to assume that the uh, Ident that the identification reconstruction efficiencies, the two vertices were uncorrelated. And we assumed that uh, requiring two brought you down to negligible backgrounds. This is an estimate, but it's a reasonably good one. Um, so you can see this is you know, pretty powerful. It is more powerful than any other search we're aware of. There is a new prompt search from CMS that came out after we did uh, this plot that would uh, fill in some region up here uh, in, in the short lifetime uh, corner. Okay. So in terms of improvements to what these uh, kinds of low mass searches might be able to do, extensions to their analysis, we have a variety of other signals that are not well covered. Uh, so CMS and their scouting analysis explicitly has a pointing cut. So what is pointing is they have this angle between the reconstructed uh, PT of the muon pair and the, the direction uh, uh, to, the, to the beam line. Uh, and if you look at in one of our non-pointing scenarios, um, a couple different kinematic choices here, uh, making that pointing cut keeps a tiny fraction, well, small fraction of order, you know, 10% of the total events. And that's a big hit to signal efficiency. LACB uh, does report results for an inclusive selection with no pointing cut. Um, and so you can see, for instance, that the relative uh, reach of LHCB here in purple to the CMS search is much bigger. Also, you should compare the reach of this uh, uh, search compared to the, you know, this is you know, orders of magnitude less uh, than uh, the sensitivity of uh, scenario A. And there is probably, a, you know, some quite some room for CMS to optimize their analysis uh, to sort of trade off between relaxing this pointing cut uh, to you know, improve signal efficiency. It also lets some more background. The degree to which that uh, cut can be relaxed is something uh, that will depend on the mass and the lifetime bin you're sitting in and can presumably uh, claw back quite a bit of reach here. The main difference between scenario B1 and B2 is again, the signal multiplicity. Um, and so you can see that, again, this is getting harder and harder because you're just playing the you know, number of signal events is, is going down. Okay, so here finally uh, is uh, scenario C. This is again is a very challenging scenario. It is not currently well covered at all. Um, the scouting search that CMS does uh, and the uh, displaced you know, dimuon pair search that LHCB does, those are always going after resonance signals. Um, the mass distribution that we see for a couple representative uh, scenario C models here, you can see it, it is you know, spread out rather you know, non-trivially over a wide range of uh, muon invariant mass. So this is obviously harder to dig out of a background uh, because you know, it's spread out across a number of bins, but also it really complicates these analyses because the background estimation, you know, the, the, you know, these are not background free searches, so there's quite a bit of background. The background model uh, is not all you know, physics. It combines you know, physics uh, sources with you know, instrumental uh, sources, a variety of fakes, you know, coincidences, and so on. 
And the background estimation strategy has basically been, you know, look bin by bin for resonant excesses and you know, model your background as being smooth otherwise. And if you have a smooth non-resonant signal, you have to come up with a much more clever background estimation strategy to try to, you know, cleanly dig it out of your background. Um, yes, so in some of the other scenarios, uh, there are a variety of model knobs to sort of consistently set the lifetime of the long-lived particle. In this case, uh, it's uh, more predictive because the uh, three-body decay and the limited three-body phase space uh, is a large part of what is giving a fairly long lifetime to the eta in this case. You can see how the uh, lifetime depends on the mass splitting between the uh, dark pion and the dark edameson here, and it can get uh, quite long, uh, quite fast. Um, good. All right, so now let me wrap up. I have talked about dark showers, particularly at low mass, by which I mean low overall uh, center of mass energy is produced from, for instance, standard model Higgs decay. This also means if you're interested in you know, showers as opposed to producing you know, one or two you know, hidden hadrons, well, two or three hidden hadrons, I should say, uh, also therefore low mass dark mesons. Um, this is a project I think is important because fleshing out the search sensitivity in this very challenging regime is important for maximizing the discovery sensibility and uh, making sure that our discovery capability is as minimally sensitive as possible to the very challenging uh, you know, theoretical uncertainties that are involved in making concrete predictions for the signatures from confining hidden sectors. Uh, I've shown you two different strategies uh, that can help to inform the experimental search program. Uh, using some simplified models, we tried to clarify the regions of signature space where uh, it would pay off to develop uh, strategies that go after you know, relatively high multiplicity searches, as well as places where you know, displaced uh, objects are particularly important um, with various different kinds of uh, displaced objects. And uh, developed a fairly specific model involving some uh, chiral field theory, that, you know, chiral perturbation theory that was kind of fun to work through uh, for at least for those of us writing it. Um, the main aim of developing the specific model was to present a relatively simple signature generator for generating uh, low mass muon rich final states. Um, we use this in part to highlight the potential reach and power of the data scouting program to advance discovery capabilities at you know, quite low PT. And we've uh, made several uh, suggestions for extensions to the analysis program in this area, uh, ranging from easy like Look for two vertices to very hard. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention and I will conclude here. Thank you, Jesse, for the nice talk. And so if we have some questions from the audience, please. So I, I have one. So um have 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 you compared your these models with uh, current bounds for them? Yeah, so these are the leading bounds. Ah, sorry, so sorry, I missed that. Okay. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Thanks for the nice talk. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is: uh, Is it possible we can distinguish the uh, multiple cascade decay and the dark showers uh, for your uh, signature. And the second one, is, uh, if we can have the uh, lepton colliders like the uh, Higgs factory in the future, so how they can help to improve the, the search of your signatures? Those are both great questions. So your first question, like how can you distinguish uh, uh, hidden sectors from long cascade decays? I would argue that those are actually secretly the same thing because uh, if you take the point of view that you have a higher dimension dual, for instance, to, uh, description, right? So, so you can think about 
say KK models as uh, you know, a, a dual description of a uh, confining gauge theory and you can construct you know, very long uh, KK cascades. So there's some limit where you know, specific uh, you know, cascade decays uh, in analogy to specific uh, dark shower signatures actually becomes precise. Uh, through the duality. So yeah, in general, that's a hard problem. Um, in terms of you know, figuring out the physics of what is governing any particular uh, uh, you know, discovery. So this will of course proceed in stages. Imagine that you found, you know, imagine that one of these scouting searches you know, found something. <laughs> the very first thing that would happen is that uh, uh, you would want to put in new triggers that could record the entire event that has one of these things. Because right now, the only information that's being recorded in these events is basically the muons and properties of the muons. Um, so once you did that, um, you would start trying to see you know, what particles are you making? You know, did these particles, you know, can you ever get uh, resonances uh, you know, when you put these particles together or or not. And so it takes some time and a huge amount of statistics, but eventually, you know, one would be able to ask questions like, you know, given the you know, spatial and energetic distribution of these things, um, given the multiplicities, um, one would be able to work out a lot, um, you know, given sufficient, uh, statistics. But I think you know, if you did actually find one of these things, the uh, motivation to you know, build something that you know, a collider that could accumulate the sufficient statistics would be you know, much easier. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's a uh, very general answer. Yeah. So the next answer is what about Higgs factories? So I think the, the key question here is about whether or not efficient triggering is possible. So Higgs factories or E plus E minus uh, you know, machines, right? Um, they have a relatively limited luminosity um, in, compared to you know, even HLLHC in terms of the absolute number of Higgs that they will be able to make. So if you can efficiently trigger on whatever exotic decay you're looking at, then uh, hadron machines are probably better. Um, although you know, there's also the question of background separation, but for signals like this, I assume that that will not be hard. Um, whereas if you can't efficiently trigger on it, then something like Higgs factory offers an enormous amount of you know, possibility. Yeah. So something like scenario A, you know, a trigger is reasonably straightforward. Um, something like, you know, scenario C, this might be much harder. Um, and in this case, you know, clean environment, uh, would, uh, make a big difference. I see. So trigger is a main issue. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Any other question? So if not, let's thanks again to the speaker. Thank you very much for the nice talk. And mm -hmm. so thank you. To yeah. See you again somewhere. <laughs> I look forward Jesse, to excuse it. me. Uh, uh, thank yeah. you very much for your nice talk. So do you mind to share your uh, talk slide with us? Certainly. Shall I send it to you by email? Yeah, no problem. Thanks a lot. I will do that. Okay. 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 See you. Right. So, thank bye you bye. very much. See you. Thank you.